Hello and welcome back to the show. So I am super excited for today's episode of the FLA podcast because I am joined by what can only be described as a legend in the real estate industry, Jim Rimley. So just to tell you guys a little bit about Jim, Jim started out in real estate at only the age of 19. And in his first year in real estate, he actually became a top 1% realtor and listed 150 properties by the age of 20. So he was definitely getting started off on the right foot. And by age 24, Jim actually started his own real estate company, which he has grown to over 17 offices and is now the largest independent brokerage in the entire state of Oregon. So Jim is definitely somebody who has a wealth of experience and knowledge. And in today's episode, he is going to be sharing with us some of the best strategies for agents and brokers out there who want to grow a team, an organization, or a brokerage as far as how to attract agents, retain them, and also how to help them produce more and actually be successful in real estate. So Jim, I'm super excited to have you on the show and uh, welcome. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's super exciting to be with you today. For sure. So before we get started and into the discussion here, I'd love for you to be able to share a little bit about your story. I know we covered some of the highlights of your real estate career, uh, but mm -hmm. I, I would love to hear you tell your story and just how you got started and became so successful at such an early age and translated that success into growing your own company as well. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. So I'm first of all, you know, I people hear the highlights, but they don't hear the, the journey, right? So the, I was a college dropout um, and I got talked into getting my license from a buddy of mine. I finished, he didn't. And I worked in a lumber mill uh, before I became a licensed realtor. So when I got my license, I had $1,500 to my name, which was, you know, base, it, I didn't have $1,500. I'll put it another way. I had, I had a credit line of $1,500 <laughs> and, and I was driving an old Chevy Citation. So it was a uh, very touch and go for the first six months. But <clears throat> what I had to do quickly was to figure out how I model could model others that were more successful than me. So I read all the books. I attended a lab of seminars, whatever I could. There was no webinars back then, but so you had to go in person. Um, and I, I just took a lot of notes and I became a real student of the profession. And that's what I recommend people do today. We got such advantages with podcasts and webinars and all the information that we have available. But at the same time, it can be a little bit distracting because you can become kind of a squirrel and never get anything done because you're too distracted. But there is a lot of information out there. But in the my first um, couple of years, I did have a lot of success. And then I pivoted, opened my first company. And then we grew that, as you mentioned, to 17 offices. I actually did sell that company in 2006 before the great crash. I taught for NAR for 10 years. Uh, all the designation programs. And then I circled back and a buddy of mine bought a company in Southern Oregon. And I eventually became an owner in that company. We grew that from about 30 agents to 250 agents in a small town in Southern Oregon, with 80, population base of 80,000, doing uh, 3,000 transactions a year, $1.4 billion in sales. So one of the top 500 companies in America by volume in a little tiny town. And so my claim to fame now is really helping offices and brokerages recruit experienced agents and then take your current agents and make them as productive as humanly possible um, so that we can maximize profit and help your agents be profitable as well. So that's kind of my little backstory there. Yeah, and that's wonderful. I mean, you've been able to really create a lot of success and starting from, um, you know, somebody from more, more or less humble backgrounds, right? So yeah. uh, I love to dig into that just right away. So, you know, your job right now is mostly uh, as far as helping a, uh, brokerages growing their offices, right, and attracting uh, attracting experience and quality agents. So let's talk a little bit about that, you know, because a lot of agents, they have a lot of success selling real estate as an individual, but have yeah. a hard time transitioning into an agent attractor or a leader, right? So what would you yeah. say are some of the things that successful agents should look out for when they are transitioning to that role and really looking to build out a team or a brokerage? Well, the first thing is it's not a direct A to B, right? So it's not as if you're, if you're a great agent, you're going to be a great recruiter. Um, it's two different skill sets, really. And the biggest mistake that uh, new recruiters make is they focus in on uh, commissions. And it's all about the commission plan. Who can give me the best commission deal? And if I have the lowest commission splits, or excuse me, the highest commission splits, then it's going to attract a bunch of agents. And that's just not true. The reality is that if, if people went to work for the lowest commission splits, the lowest commission split companies would have all the agents and they don't. So the reality is it's not about commission splits. And that's the first thing that as a recruiter, you have to accept. You want to believe that, but it's just not true. So what, it, what, what is true 
is that the ultimate attractor for agents is per agent productivity. It's helping them be productive agents and closing more transactions. So if I can prove to you that I can help you close more transactions and make your life easier, that's why you're going to come to work for me. And so the question then is, what's my value proposition behind that? And how do I present that value in a way that's motivating to you as an agent? So I got to stack up my, my benefits and uh, get you in a position where you say, oh, you know what? That I think I see how that could add five transactions or 10 transactions a year to my bottom line. So that's like the first step in the in the process is creating a value proposition. Right. So what you're saying is instead of trying to race the bottom when it comes yeah. to the commission uh, structure, you want to actually provide value to the agents, right? And actually help yeah. them do better, sell more houses. So that way they can have a better lifestyle themselves and create that value proposition for them. So that way they can, you know, basically integrate into your system and become a higher producing agent. Exactly. So the, the race to the bottom has already happened and we've already hit bottom. <laughs> so there's offices out there that are literally, they're really a loss leader. Their real estate brokerage is a loss leader, which funnels business into their mortgage or title companies that they also own. So they're just treating it as a loss leader. They could care less whether they make a dollar on their brokerages. And so it, we've already hit zero there. So what we have to do is say, let's think about what we need to do to turn that around as brokerage owners. And what you're seeing is a lot of brokerage owners are going backward and they're going back up to scale and they're going, hey, we're not going to do 100%. We're going to do 80, 70, 60. I see some offices at 50, 50. You might say, how would, why would anybody go to work for a 50, 50 office in today's world? There's only one reason. The only reason you're going to come to work for me as a 50, 50 split is if I can deliver to you leads that close and that you aren't going to able to generate yourself. If I can give you leads and marketing and branding and support services, and I can help you close 20 transactions and you're closing three a year now or five a year now, every day of the week, you're going to give me 50% because you're going to give all that money away anyway to other Zillow and Realtor.com and all these other different things, except now I'm managing it as a broker. So the smart leaders, the smart brokers out there are now turning the, turning the tables and they're saying, okay, let's put together a package that delivers I would call it nurtured leads is the new thing. It's not just leads because leads are kind of like, what's a lead? Nurtured leads or basically we have an ISA that's nurturing these leads along and you're handing those off in a live, uh, almost like an appointment. That's where you're going to take it to the next level. So there's really three things that attract agents today. Nurtured leads, amazing marketing, right? And great training and support services. So marketing leads and, and training, I think, are, are the, the, like the trifecta for a great office. Right. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, having leads for the agents is a really good attractor. So let's to touch a little bit more into that uh, because a lot of agents or a lot of team leaders out there, uh, they try to lead with that. Right. And they're not necessarily successful. Sometimes a lot of them, you know, end up spending too much money or end up finding themselves in a position where the agents who are paying that split end up outgrowing their teams. Uh, so what would you say are some of the things that you've seen are people that are making the mistakes that they shouldn't be making when it comes to providing leads for either the agents and their team or their brokerage? So if you go back in time, let's like rewind the clock five years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, here's the model that a lot of teams have been built on. Okay. So five years, 10 years ago, I could go to Zillow or I could go to Realtor.com and I could buy leads at a level that I could then hand them to my office buyer's agent, right? That I have on my team and I can make a spread on that. I could have a return on investment. So I invest 5,000, I make 10,000. I invest 7,000, I make 14,000. That was a spread there because like even with my split, I can make money with that. Today that's gone negative. You cannot make money buying Zillow leads and handing them to a buyer's agent. It just doesn't pencil anymore. It's a negative 30, 32% return on money. So every dollar you spend, you lose a dollar 32. So you got to throw that away and say that model doesn't work. It feels good because you're handing leads to agents, but it just doesn't pencil. So then I got to say, what am I going to do now? Right? So what you have to do is you have to become the Zillow. You have to become the realtor.com. How do you do it? You got to go into Facebook and Google and start marketing and start generating your own leads, taking those leads in, either have an ISA on your team or Maybe a buyer's agent does it, but you're, they're well-trained to do it. And they're going to nurture those leads along. And now you're going to get back to a close rate that's going to enable you to have a profit. Because what you can do is you can get your lead cost down. Depends on your market, but $10 to $20 a lead is not unreasonable. Whereas if you're buying them from Realtor.com or Zillow, you're paying $150 a lead. 
$200 a lead in some markets. So you can get, you know, 10 times the lead volume, and this is what's going to bring you back to profitability. So that's the step one is I've got to figure out my lead flow. You can use AI, you can use automation for, to help with this. And a lot of the team leaders are starting to go heavy into AI and they should. Um, there's a lot of techniques with AI that can really um, take you to a higher level with, with tech. Right. So you mentioned AI and I really want to touch a little bit into that, you know, just as a, you know, almost like a, a side note, if you will. Uh, yeah. But it's really not right because it is super important. I've seen a lot of agents and teams and, and company owners invest heavily into this. And like you said, as they should. So what are some strategies that you've seen either work in your business or other teams and, and, and companies out there uh, as far as leveraging AI? Because I think the biggest problem people are running into with leveraging AI is not knowing the use cases, right? Because you can spend hours and hours of of time and hundreds of thousands of dollars investing in AI and just kind of use it for fun. But what yeah. does it actually do for your business? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of use cases, but I'll give you a couple. One would be uh, using AI in your mailing campaign. So I'm a big believer in mailings. I was, I just, I was a guy that mailed 8,000 pieces of mail a month as an agent. So, but with AI today, you can refine this to a degree that's almost unheard of. So let's go back in time again, 10, 20 years ago, you're doing a mailing. The numbers behind a mailing 10, 20 years ago was this, and it still made money, was that for every 100 pieces I'd mail, I'd send out. If I'm doing the right kind of mailing, and I'm not talking about postcards, I'm talking about stationary, three paragraphs, two to three sentences per paragraph, color stationary, high bond paper, digitally signed, uh, mail merged letter style, that's going to average a 1% response rate. So for every eight, or excuse me, every 100 pieces of mail you send, you get one positive response. For every eight positive responses, you average one listing today. But you still have seven you know, positive responses that will nurture over time. And generally, two or three of those will turn into a listing in the next year. So even at that, and by the way, that mailing is going to cost you about 1500 bucks, uh, at a $1,500 investment to get one listing now and two or three more in the next year, that's still a great investment compared to almost any other kind of marketing you're doing. So you can scale that up. But now with AI, I can take my list that I'm mailing to, I can shoot it through uh, companies out there that'll do this for you, Enscope being one of them, but there's a lot of them. So I shoot it through the list and it will, it'll, it'll measure everybody that you send through based on 500 data points and say, of these, the list that you just sent me, here's the most likely sellers in this group uh, based on 500 data points that they're tracking about what these people's behaviors are online, you know, what they're searching for, what they're looking for. And it will narrow that group down to you being able to really zone in on your target audience. So that's one, that's one use case of AI. Everybody doing mailings at scale should be using AI to target uh, more correctly who they're mailing to. And you can have amazing, amazing results. Uh, so that would be one example. Another example, just with uh, we're using AI for, which is a simple thing, but it actually is not is we're, we're taking uh, with our coaching students and we're saying, what, who's our target audience right now? So the number one seller in America today in 2024 is uh, empty nesters. So empty nesters are your number one seller. They're my age, they're in their fifties, kids are yeah. out of the house, they're scaling down, they're buying second houses, they're just the best client. They're not interest rate sensitive, high equity in their house, yada, yada, yada. So how do I target these people? Well, one, one way you can target them is to say, what are they interested online and looking at? And the way I do this is I use answerthepublic.com. Go to answerthepublic.com, say, what's an empty nester is going to be looking at in terms of real estate? It'll give you that most search terms. One of those terms that we determined in my um, my classes with my students is, you know, where do they, what are the best retirement cities in America? That was the one we get, came up with. We fed that into an AI called writesonic.ai. And right, Sonic, what it does is it'll create an article and, and the way it creates an article on any topic you give it. So if I say, give me the top five cities people are retiring to in 2024, it'll reach into the internet, do all its research in the background, and it will spit out an article based on that topic. And you can take credit for the article, even though it's AI written. And now what I can do is I could use that as a lead generator online with a Facebook ad that says, hey, find out the top five cities people are moving to in 2024. They sign up, now they go into your drip system, and now you're dripping on them. So, I mean, those are that's just a couple uses, um, but you got to really kind of get outside the box and, and think it through. The other things that um, I'm seeing people use for to, to, to do AI at scale is using like systems like Syntasia or HeyGen, where you, rec you, you create your own avatar of yourself. You feed it three or four 
videos of yourself, just like we're doing today, it will create an avatar of you. And then you can feed it any script you want to, and it will create uh, an AI version of you delivering that script, but without ums, without mistakes, without stumbles. And if you think about you need to, if you think about scaling on video and you're like, it's just so time consuming creating the video and everything else. Now you remove all that. You remove all your stumbles, you remove all your fumbles, you remove everything else. And it's a perfect delivery every single time. And I can put out three videos a day on social. I can put out five videos a day if I want to. And suddenly my audience begins scaling, scaling, scaling really rapidly. That's another use case for video. Do I recommend you do that always? No, I think you should do some organic video too. But if you're using that half the time, you can double your, your content creation really, really quickly. So there's a lot of other ways we can do that, but that's a couple. That's actually really cool. So basically what I'm hearing is, you know, data analytics, right? With the first use case that you talked about being able to yep. target uh, a more specific audience and yep. then lead magnet creation and also content creation, right? Creating things yes. that would in the past take a lot of time, a lot of research. Now yep. just simply doing some research, feeding it into the right uh, AI tool and then having to spit something back out that you would have probably written uh, the same way uh, anyways yourself, or maybe even not quite as good as the AI. So that's super cool because a lot of people are investing the time in AI, but they're not necessarily, um, they're not necessarily getting the use case out of it, right? Maybe they're just, yeah. you know, writing articles and none of them are converting, right? And you don't want right. to do that because that becomes then a waste of time and energy. Yeah, and the other benefit to the right Sonic um, tool, just really quickly, is that uh, this is often not thought about, but it's super important, is that if I have a blog on my website, which we all should have a blog on our website, and I then every day or every, you know, three times a week, or my assistant's doing it, is creating this these posts based on the, the answer to the public, you know, kind of an algorithm where we know what people are searching for and we're creating articles based on what people are searching for. And we start loading those blog articles into our website. What's going to happen is Google's going to index that. And it's going to say, this website happens to have a lot of great content people are looking for. Suddenly your search rankings will rise. Your SEO search engine optimization will increase dramatically. And you'll move from being 25th page, 25 pages down to being second or third page to first page. So don't underestimate the power of that. There's a lot of power in that. Right. So you can actually use AI to help you rank your articles in Google SEO search terms, which is, is exactly. you know, in our opinion, one of the more powerful ways to uh, generate a lot of leads and, and, and traffic is through search engine because those are organic and people yeah. are actually looking for a solution that you can then provide to them directly, right? It's basically direct response um, at that point. And a very high intent because they found that article and they were searching for it. Right, exactly. Yeah. So uh, I want to talk with you now a little bit about agent retention, right? So we talked about what you need to do as a company owner, as a team leader in order to attract agents. Uh, yeah. But then let's talk about, you know, those agents out there or those uh, team or, or company owners out there who are attracting a lot of agents and maybe having quite a bit of success attracting agents and experienced agents to their teams uh, or their companies, but they're not necessarily able to retain them, right? Their their yeah. agents are not quite as sticky, right? What, 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 what did you as far as what, from what you've seen and your experience, what would you say are the reasons for that? And how can, uh, you know, the team leaders and the brokerage owners out there actually uh, fix that problem, right? Is it with the right messaging? Is it just with um, actually following up with their agents when they're actually in their team? You know, what is the big issue there and how can people retain more agents? So what I always tell my brokerage coaching students is hard value, hard value attracts agents. It brings them to your company. Soft value keeps agents at your company. So I'll give you an example. Hard value is I have a tech stack. That's great. I got an AI tech stack. I've got leads I can give you. I've got amazing digital presentations, hard value, tangible things. Soft value is the culture of your office, you know? The training, the motivation, the inspiration, the friendship, the uh, camaraderie, uh, that's what's going to keep people at your company. And that sounds soft, but it's so important. And here's a great example of that. It, as a leader, your job is to create a personal relationship with everybody in your company. This is the hard thing. As you scale, it gets harder and harder. But um, the personal relationship just means that they all your agents need to look at you as being their friend. So friends don't leave friends right? Uh, people leave companies, but they don't leave friends. So here's the, a good litmus test on this is if I walked up to you and I said, okay, I'm going to pick somebody randomly out of your company. I'm just going to go down the roster and say, this is the one. Could you tell me their, their wife's name? 
Could you tell me their kid's name? Could you tell me their favorite restaurant? Could you tell me where they graduated college? I want to, I could go through a list of four or five, 10 things. And if you couldn't answer all those, that tells me you haven't gotten a close enough relationship with them. What's their hobby? What's their greatest aspiration outside of real estate? So you need to get to know people. And the way you do that is just by conversation and having, um, you know, taking the time to get to know people. There's some ways to build soft value too. And that is you got to think about culture in your company. So what a lot of weak team leaders do, a lot of weak uh, brokerage owners do is they think about agents transactionally. I just got another notch on the belt, another notch on the belt, recruit another one, recruit another one. And it's all about volume instead of saying it's about quality. And so what we need to do is we need to say, I'm going to create a culture of excellence that keeps people and retains people. And way, the way I can do that is number one, my office meetings, I have to have an office meeting every week and it's got to be amazing. It's got to be like a, a revival at these things, super inspirational, motivational, educational. And the way you know you're doing a good job at your office meetings is people come. <laughs> if you have low attendance, that's why people say, that's why people shut down their office meetings. Like, oh, I get low attendance. You know, I get low attendance. Your meeting sucks. So if your meeting didn't suck, you'd have high attendance. So the, the, the issue is that your agent's not attending, it's you delivering a good meeting. So you need training on coaching on that. So a great meeting. But then on top of that, you should be doing a social event at your company every six to eight weeks. We call them social nights. You're bringing in, you're inviting the spouses, the kids, the significant others, and you're doing something as a group. And that could be a million different things, but you're bringing people together. And then you're also helping agents connect socially with their own databases. So I'll give you an example. In a couple of weeks, our company every June does, uh, we call our client appreciation party, call it a cap party. So what we do is we go to every agent and we say, invite 10 of your best clients uh, to come out. We're going to feed them. Um, uh, we get food carts to come in. So we're going to feed them. We're going to buy the drinks. We're going to have a live band. We're going to have kids stations. It's going to be an amazing event. We started doing it in the parking lot, you know, 12 years ago, 15 years ago when we started it. And we had, you know, a couple hundred people come. Now we rent out uh, this amazing big park area. And last time we had about 2000 people come. So it's one of the biggest events in our community every year. So it's an amazing event. And it's uh, an incredible culture builder because no other company is doing it. So that's what you got to do. Think about the culture of your company. That, that's what, that would be my answer. It's a long answer to a short question. No, that's actually very important because people don't think about that as um, a retention tool, right? And sometimes it's actually difficult for people to develop a culture. But I love what you said about there having the uh, office meetings and making sure that it's good, right? Because we've seen people host different types of office meetings, team meetings here and there, right? different types of, uh, you know, maybe trainings, they call it masterminds or, you know, you know, powwows, whatever it is, they, they name it, but it's usually the same thing, right? It's an office meeting, right? It's pretty much yeah. the same concept that they're trying to, uh, they're trying to get their agents to all come and all have com camaraderie and be together and hopefully teach them something as well. So you mentioned running a great uh, office meeting. So what would you say are some of the aspects of actually running a great office meeting and maybe some things to avoid if you're trying to run an office meeting and actually want your agents to uh, attend those. So you got to measure yourself as, as a presenter. If you're just never going to be a great presenter, you need to have somebody else running the meeting. So maybe you're not a great MC and you need a great MC, a motivational MC, but a great office meeting. will. the way is our, ours is broken down is we have 10 or 20 minutes in the beginning. We're giving people educational content. We're talking about the market stats. We're talking about strategy, techniques, scripting, dialogues, things that are happening in the market. So we're giving them really strong content. And then we'll go into um, haves and wants. What do people have? But what do people want, you know, in the market? Then we'll bring up the listings and we'll let agents talk about their listings. But we also bring in partners. So it's not just our voice because people get, you're never the prophet in your own land. No matter how good a speaker you are, no matter how good a motivator you are, people get sick of hearing you. My agents get sick of hearing me. So what happens is we need to bring in other speakers and other voices. So you can bring in, um, you know, a lender to talk every time about what's going on with the lending. You can bring in a title person. You can bring in other people from the outside to speak. But one of the best things you can do is bring in a champion from your own company and say, hey, John had this amazing success. He did this lead gen this week and he got two listings or you got a buyer out of it. Come up here and tell us what you did, John. He gets up, he talks about it and it creates some professional jealousy, which is good. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we, we inspire each other by holding up champions. Uh, and I think that's that's the key to a great meeting. It's a lot of interaction. It's not a monologue. It's a dialogue with everybody in the office. So we're 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 capturing uh, people's hearts and minds that way. Right. So featuring a champion, like you said, featuring somebody from your office, right, from your team, 
to highlight some something they did, right? A success yeah. they had, a win yeah. they had, right? That's a that's a huge deal when it comes to actually getting people to uh, those meetings, right? Because they want to be they want to be highlighted, right? They want to be appreciated. Right. People yeah. want to have that attention, right? Even when <clears throat> it's not the first thing on their list, it's still nice to to enjoy a little bit of that appreciation, especially when you know that you've put in all that effort into creating that as well. Right. hundred percent. Well, hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. So I love to now talk a little bit about as far as the third part of growing an office, which is actually getting your agents to produce more. Right. And I think it really ties back into what you said about attracting agents, which is helping them produce more real estate. Right. So yeah. what are some of the things that, uh, you know, offices and, and broker owners can be doing uh, right now, especially now with this new announcement of the NAR lawsuit and all the changes happening in the industry, uh, what are some of the top strategies that are necessarily duplicatable and can be easily systematized so that way you can not only be successful as an individual using these strategies, but can actually teach them or provide the agents in your team a, a concept or a framework that they can then apply in their own way in order to be more successful and actually sell more real estate going into the rest of 2024 and moving forward? So number one, the NAR settlement um, is probably the biggest recruiting opportunity in the last 10 years. So if you're listening to this and your brokerage owner, your team leader, you should be saying to yourself, what am I doing to leverage this opportunity? You're not going to get another one like this for a long time. So the reason I say that is because there's a lot of offices and team leaders that are not at all prepared for these changes and they're not leading their agents. And the agents that are in these offices that are on these teams are nervous and rightly so that they don't have any direction. They don't have any leadership and they have no idea what to do next. So this is a massive recruiting opportunity here, right? Um, and you should look at it that way. So you can recruit to that in a lot of ways. If you've got a buyer presentation that you've created and you're training on, that's, that's a way to bring people in. If you're coaching people on what to say in terms of commission conversations, that's a way to have a, 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 a recruit maybe be attracted to you. So there's a lot of conversation around that, but in terms of overall agent productivity, the number one thing you can do to help agents be productive is let them know that they're being watched and set an expectation. So it's called the Hawthorne effect. So the Hawthorne effect is as an independent contractor, we're suddenly given something that's very dangerous when we get in the real estate world, which is freedom. And most agents have the freedom to go absolutely broke and they mostly do. 87% of agents don't survive the first two years in the industry. So what they miss is accountability and having them somebody stand over their shoulder at a real job and say, you're going to do this and then you're going to get paid. What we need to do is take the leadership role again and say, guys, let me give you a model for success. And this is the key. So what successful brokers do is they give their agents playbooks and they say, here's playbook A, here's playbook B, here's playbook C, here's playbook D and E. Which of these playbooks are you going to run? Because this is what works, right? So what are you running? What are you doing? What are you doing exactly? Um, and then what you can do is if they if they're not engaging, they're not producing, you need to step in and set an expectation for them because if, a person without expectation is not going to perform. This is where the Hawthorne effect takes effect. So, by the way, quick quick thing about the Hawthorne effect. The Hawthorne effect is based on a, a study that was done by GE. They had a plant in Hawthorne, uh, Pennsylvania, and they had this uh they had these people coming in and they were just changing the ergonomics of this manufacturing plant that they own ge owned at the time and what they found was that the ergonomics had nothing to do with productivity what happened was the employees at these these plants thought they were being watched by management and because they thought they were being watched their production increased dramatically and what they found was that it's not the ergonomics or any of the lighting or anything it's nothing to do with it what it was it's all about being watched and having somebody be accountable to someone else so this is what agents need from you. So here's the thing. If you have an agent that's not productive, let's say you got an agent that closed one deal in the last six months, and a ton of you have that on your rosters right now. What are you going to do about that? You can just let them keep running and by and large, you're going to get out of the business because you're not helping them. Instead, you should go to them and say, hey, I just did a little research this morning. I see you closed one deal in the last six months. Obviously, that's not good enough for you. I mean, you can't make a living on one deal a year <laughs> or every six months. It's not Obviously, it's not good enough for us. I want to put you on a plan for success. And here's what I'm, I'm going to reset our expectation. My plan for success is, and I call this the de-hiring process. Every week, you're going to turn in a sheet to me, and it's going to outline exactly what you've been doing in terms of lead gen, how many hours per day you're spending in lead gen, and exactly what you're doing. We actually have a sheet for this for our team. And it's going to outline calls made, text sent, you know, emails, social media posts, every possible thing they could be doing 
everything's documented. And then they get the results. How many appointments did you set? Buyer meetings, seller meetings, everything else. You're going to turn that in to me every Friday. Okay. And if you don't want to do that, that's okay. But it's probably, we should probably just part company because this isn't going to work. If you want us to be successful, and I think you do, this is what we have to do. They'll all say, yes, they want to do it. And then the question is, are they going to turn it in every Friday? As soon as the first time they don't turn it in on Friday, I call them and say, hey, I'm missing your sheet. What's going on? And now they're going to know they're being watched. One or two things is going to happen. They're going to rise and their productivity will skyrocket or they'll fail out of the business, but they're going to fail anyway. When you start to do this and you be consistent with watching your team and encouraging your team, your productivity will rise as a company, but you've got to be a leader and you got to step up. The reason why brokers don't do this is because they're afraid. They're afraid of the agent's going to leave. Who cares if they're not closing transactions? I don't care. Leave. You're dragging down my overall productivity. So that's that's the number one thing. They got to know they're being watched. And you got to set expectations for people and you need to give them playbooks on what exactly they need to be doing. Those are like the, the, the three things I think that I think are the most important thing to do in leadership position. Let me give you one more idea for leaders that are listening to this. When you're engaged with agents, you're doing walk, you have your coffee cup management, you're walking around the office, and you're talking to people, or you're virtually doing it, you know, maybe by making calls and so forth. When you're making those calls and you're talking to people, the number one question you're going to ask them is if, and if you're, if, if it was Kobe, it was you, I'd say, Kobe, tell me what's your pipeline right, like right now? What's going on with your pipeline? And then you'd be forced to tell me, well, I got, you know, one deal in escrow. I got, you know, my one, you know, whatever is going on with you. And I'd say, hey, are you comfortable with that? Or do you want some coaching? And then you're going to say, well, no, I need some coaching. Let's, let's go to it. Spend a half hour with me. Let's coach you up. Let's get you focused and get you fired up. If they know that every inner time they have an interaction with me, I'm going to say, how's your pipeline? They're suddenly, they're going to rise and you're going to watch them rise. And they're going to feel better about it because they know they got a coach that cares. So that's kind of my approach to it. Yeah. So you mentioned that giving agents playbook, right? It's like a coach, right? When they're getting new players on their team, right? Making sure yeah. that they're integrated with the playbook and also giving them that accountability, which is not necessarily talked quite a, quite about or quite as much about in the industry when it comes to good leadership, right? Because a lot of it yeah. is motivation, inspiration, providing value and coaching. But, you know, there's a lot of leaders out there who have a ton of value, but their agents aren't using it. Right. And right. you don't want to, you don't want that to happen. Right. You don't want to spend so much time creating infrastructure and value and being able to coach people and giving them the right playbooks only for the agents in your organization and your in your office and your team just to not use it, just to say great things about it, but you know, never take a second look at it aside from the first time you you presented it to them. Right. So yeah. that's extremely important is that accountability piece. Now now, as far as, you know, getting feedback, right, because I think a lot of uh, a lot of leaders out there, they take feedback, they like to take feedback from their agents, right, especially when something isn't working, uh, they want to know why it's not working, they want to know, you know, what's, you know, what what is missing, right, as far as their value stack and their value proposition, um, you know, is that something that you teach other team leaders, other brokers to do, is that something you guys have done as far as getting feedback, because there is a quite delicate balance there between, you know, taking feedback from agents and then implementing it, and also, taking so much feedback that you're now overhauling your entire system and, and doing something completely different. Yeah. So two things on that. One thing I recommend to broker owners and team leaders is that you take, uh, I, I like to do it on Thursdays, but every Thursday you invite a, a, at least one agent and maybe a pod of agents, a group of agents, depending on how big your company is to lunch. And you just say, Hey, listen, I'd love to take you to lunch. No agenda. Just want to get your feedback on how we're doing as a company and, you know, buy your lunch. And now we'll get them into a room. We're going to buy them lunch. And we're going to say, okay, guys, give me two things we could do better. And you let them hit you with those two things. Now, there may be things I can't improve. That's just logistically, you know, money-wise, I can't improve it. But at least I'm hearing them out. And they're feeling like they've, they got it off the chest. So that's one thing I do. The second thing is uh, we've done this for years. Uh, and this is to have a focus group in the office. So if you got an office that has... You know, 30 or 40 agents is when we started. We grew to 200 plus agents. But when we started, we had 30 or 40 agents. So in a 30 to 40 agent company, that's maybe six agents that volunteer to be on a focus group. And we say, well, here's what this looks like to be on the focus group. You're going to meet every other month. We're going to buy you guys lunch in the conference room. You're, no management's allowed to attend. We're going to have one of our staff members attend. They're going to take notes. And you're just going to talk about positive change that we can make at the company that you think would be reasonable uh, for us to, to think about, at least. We may not be able to do everything, but the the the, the gals that are taking all the notes or the guys that are taking all the notes will give those notes back to us. We'll comment back and say, can we do that? Is that a good change? We can't do that, but we can do this. And then we'll deliver it back to you in a focus group, uh, on our focus group notes. 
that's been instrumental in so many changes at our company. A lot of times we can't do anything, but we've made staffing changes. We've made whole marketing changes. We've changed a lot of stuff at our company as a result of the focus group. So the focus group has been very, very successful and agents love it. So it's all volunteerism and agents like the fact that you're, we're engaged. It's a great recruiting tool too. Agents like that to hear that in recruiting. Meeting. Right. So I think, you know, something you mentioned there is that you guys, when you guys do these focus groups, you don't necessarily have anybody from management there, right? So you, do you think one of the reasons why it works so well is because you've removed kind of that, that authority figure, if you will, that position, yeah. even though you don't yes. might not think of it that way, but you've removed that stress for the agents. Yeah. And it, it, it allows them to talk more freely and they don't feel like they're being uh, judged for what they're saying. They're, they're, they, well, they may clam up. It just makes them feel like they can uh, open up more. So it definitely works. Right. Yeah. That's so important. Well, Jim, I think you delivered a ton of value for us here today. You shared some really interesting things that I don't ha think I've heard from other you know, coaches or other broker owners out there, right? They talk a lot about uh, kind of the same things as far as attracting retention and producing and managing their agents, but you shared a lot of actually uh, actionable and valuable tips with us here today. So for our listeners and our viewers out there who want to know more about what you're doing, maybe who want to participate in one of your many programs or want to follow you on social media, what are some of the best ways for people to follow you and to uh, get a hold of you? So my, my company, my brokerage company is called E, like elephant, erealestatecoach.com. So you can find me on all the social channels under that uh, handle, E Real Estate Coach. If you go to my website at erealestatecoach.com, we've got an incredible webinar there. It's free called uh, Rockstar Recruiting. It's two hours of kind of power packed scripts, text, emails, all kinds of techniques and tools to recruit experienced agents on your team. Absolutely free. And then if you want to take it to another level and you really want to get start getting, um, you know, a strategy in place for your specific office, uh, I'd recommend you hop in and schedule a discovery call where we can talk about our brokerage coaching services. Uh, we meet twice a month uh, with our brokerage coaching students, and it's the first Thursday and third Thursday of the month. And we dive in and we really go all in on recruiting and retention and profitability and technology to help you build a really, really successful company. So I'd love to meet with anybody that's interested in looking at that. Awesome. Yeah, that's a that's a quite a quite a bit of value you're offering there as well in your webinar. So definitely guys make sure to check that out. If you're looking to build a team, start a brokerage of your own, really looking to grow as well, make sure to check that out. We'll leave the links to all of that in the description, the show notes down below. But Jim, thank you again for being on the show today. Uh before I let you go, is there any last pieces of advice, any last tips you want to leave with the audience here? The number one thing that uh, we all struggle with as leaders is consistency. That's what you're at war with in 2024. You can have all the best ideas in the world, but if you're not consistent with what you're doing every day, that's what's going to be your downfall. So consistency, consistency, consistency uh, is absolutely key. Awesome. Love it. Thank you again, Jim. And thank you for tuning in. And we will see you on the next show. Take care. Thank you.